Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be yet another solved true crime case for my Curious Case series. Before we delve in though, as usual, I just want to plug my second channel, so be sure to jump over there and hit the subscribe button. If you're interested in seeing more content like my lovely Peaches video, then head over to my second channel because I'll be posting more not quite true crimey content over there. I'll also hopefully be posting some more just relaxed content content over there so be sure to head over there and subscribe. Now I know in my last video I said I'm going to be uploading a lot more often but as soon as I put that video live my face swelled up so big I look like a marshmallow and as you can see from these pictures that I'm putting on screen now I was really not in a fit state to go on camera and I also felt really really ill really quickly. Now don't worry it wasn't the mumps or it wasn't anything like that. I'm all vaccinated and everything and I was checked out by a doctor and as it turns out it was just a virus and my one of my glands uh, had a really bad reaction to the virus which is why only one side of my face swelled up like that. But I'm all good now, I'm fully recovered and I'm ready to delve back into the world of true crime. Now I'm not actually going to give a set schedule of when I'm going to be uploading or anything like that because I always find that I say those things and then I give myself these deadlines and then when I miss the deadlines I really beat myself up about it and it actually causes a lot more stress than is worth and it it kind of led me to burn out a bit over Christmas which is why I didn't upload over Christmas because uh, I had to like you know take some time for myself so I'm not going to be saying that I'm uploading x amount um, a week or anything like that but I will be uploading a lot more content. You can expect a lot more uploads on this channel, a lot more true crime cases. If you want to see when I'm posting or get any updates about that then be sure to follow my Twitter and my Instagram. Now myself and a few of the true crime channels are actually organizing a pretty big project that's coming up fairly soon so keep your eye out for that. I'm really excited about that. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Any theories discussed in this video are just that. They are theories, they are not facts, and they shouldn't be taken as such. Any opinions expressed in this video do not represent the views of myself, law enforcement, or anybody else directly connected to this case. Now, I've got a few comments asking why I have to say all that spiel and that disclaimer, and that's just because um, if I get something wrong or anything like that, that's a bit accusational, I could actually be sued, and I don't want to be sued. <laughs> Uh, so that's why you have to say all that. Uh, but anyway, let's delve right into this case. The evening of Friday the 27th of April 2007 was an evening that would shake the city of Deist, Belgium for years to come. And it was an evening that would change the lives of the Van Utsel family forever. 18-year-old Annick Van Utsel had planned to go out that evening with her friends, have a night out, and let her hair down after a long week of education. That evening, there was a KLJ party taking place that Annick and her friends had decided that they would go to. Now, according to Wikipedia, the KLJ is a Catholic national youth movement in Belgium that unites around 22,000 children and young people in more than 260 villages and towns. Their members primarily consist of people aged between 6 years old and 35 years old. The youth group regularly hosts parties and events where young people can come and hang out and play games and that kind of thing in a really safe environment. There's no alcohol or anything like that. It's just a really safe, fun night out. And Anik and her friends decided that uh, they would go to this party and so they did. And they were at this party until about 4 o'clock in the morning when they decided to leave on their bicycle. Anik rode with her friends along the main road in Scheffen, I believe it's pronounced, which is just outside of Diest, as you can see on this map, before she said goodbye to her friends and rode off on her own. Unknowingly, this would be the last time that anybody would see Anik alive. 
ever again. In the subsequent search parties and investigation that would follow, the case of a missing 18 year old girl would quickly spiral into a case of a serial killer. A serial killer that a lot of Belgians would compare to the infamous killer Ted Bundy. When Annick didn't return home, her family grew very worried and contacted the authorities. And over the course of the next five days, investigators would launch an intensive search operation using agents of the local and federal police and hundreds of volunteers. They used 16 horseback officers as well as a helicopter to aid in their searches. The investigators interviewed Annick's family, friends, and everybody who attended that KLJ party the evening that she went missing. Pictures of Annick were plastered across corner stores and gas stations in the hope that somebody out there might recognize her or might have seen something. 7,500 posters were distributed. Now the investigators decided to go through the cell phone tower records of towers in the area to try and see whether her phone had pinged them and where her phone had been and to try and piece together a picture of where she went that Saturday. Now, interestingly, the cell phone tower records show that her phone turned on and off a few times and connected to the towers a few times, but kind of sporadically apart. When a phone is on all the time, every now and then it'll routinely uh, ping a cell phone tower, you know, just to make sure it has service. But when a phone's turned off, obviously it won't ping the cell phone tower. So investigators knew from this data that, this, that her phone had been turned on and off multiple times. The cell phone tower records showed that her phone had last pinged a tower at the exit road of the E314 road in the town of Hallen. Search teams scoured the area, they knocked on doors of houses, but sadly they were unable to find the phone or any evidence that could lead them to Annick. That was until the 3rd of May 2007, some six days after Annick went missing. At about 6.30pm on that fateful Thursday the 3rd of May, a hiker was walking along the Albert Canal on the Canal Strat in Ganembos, which was about 16 kilometers from where Annick was last seen. The hiker glanced into the canal and noticed that there was something bobbing on the surface, and they immediately contacted the authorities. Divers then retrieved what I believe to be a box from the canal, and when the box was brought ashore, it was determined that there was likely a body inside the box. The body had been packaged inside the box and had even been weighed. The labels on the box show that the box itself had been weighed. Now the authorities were smart and they didn't want to risk destroying or contaminating any forensic evidence that could be inside the box. So they took it to the local medical examiner's office so that it could be opened in a very clean environment. And when they opened it, they discovered inside the body of a woman. They opened the package at about 8 p.m. the same evening that the box was discovered and the medical examiner quickly determined the body inside to be that of the missing 18 year old girl, Annick. She had succumbed to a fatal blow to the head. Now this led investigators to ask three questions. What happened to Annick on the night she went missing? Who had done this to her? And most importantly, why? It wouldn't be until months later on the 26th of August 2008 that the police would recover Annick's bike, which was found in a city more than 50 kilometers away in the city of Leuven. And interesting to note, the bike had actually been painted a different color to what the bike was originally and was when Annick rode it. It, it. it almost been disguised, which I think contributed to the duration of time that it took for the authorities to locate the bike. However, this bike gave no more leads to the authorities and sadly, the case went cold. That was until two years later, in the early hours of the 3rd of January 2010, when firefighters were called to the scene of a car fire and everything began to fall into place in this investigation. At 2.43 a.m., a phone call came into emergency services reporting a car fire just off the E314 at Rosendelstraat. When firefighters arrived at the scene, they were confronted with the scene of a Opal Corsa set on fire. Upon closer inspection, the firefighters noticed what appeared to be the bodies of two people 
inside the car. They quickly and efficiently extinguished the fires and the two bodies were then taken to the local medical examiner's office so that they could be examined. Through the use of dental records, both the bodies were identified. And they were identified to be that of 18-year-old Shana Appelton's and 22-year-old Kevin Paulus. The medical examiners also determined that these two people hadn't died in the car fire they had actually been murdered. They had both sustained multiple gunshot wounds. Just like in the case of 18-year-old Anik, the investigators had three primary questions. What had happened to these two people? Who had done this and why? The investigators quickly determined that Shana and Kevin had been in a relationship together and actually lived together. So they went to their home to see if they could find any further leads in this case. They also decided to talk to their neighbors to try and learn more about the couple. This would turn out to be a decision that would cause a major turn in this case. They went to speak to Shana and Kevin's neighbors and when they did, they met a man called Ronald Jansen, known to his friends and family as Ronnie. According to an article in Seven Source Seven, Ronnie was considered by many to be a model teacher. He was a sincere and responsible man, though underneath this gleaming gold star front, his childhood was sadly riddled with violence. Ronnie was born on Saturday the 6th of February 1971 in the town of Borsum. He was actually the third child in what would eventually be a family of four children. His father was a miner and his mother was a part-time cleaning lady. And from a young age, Ronnie was actually bullied at school due to him having a lisp. It got so bad in fact that Ronnie took matters into his own hands and beat up the people that were bullying him and that led to him being suspended from that school. Following that violent outbreak, Ronnie's parents switched him to a different school. However, Ronnie's issues with bullying at school were nothing compared to what he was suffering at home. His father constantly belittled and terrorized Ronnie, which installed a level of fear within him. And it was this fear that actually caused him to develop insomnia, which was a condition that he fought for the rest of his life. Ronnie, just like he did with his bullies, decided that enough was enough, and he decided to fight back against his father. But instead of physically fighting back, Ronnie decided to go one step further. Attempted murder. Ronnie's father was actually a diabetic, which meant that quite often he would have to inject himself with insulin. However, Ronnie actually swapped out the insulin with a different liquid. Ronnie's father then injected this liquid into him unknowingly, which obviously would have very bad effects. Now, miraculously, Ronnie's father managed to survive this attempted murder. And as far as I'm aware, nothing really came came of it there were no legal consequences of ronnie trying to kill his father as far as i can tell it was just swept under the rug although i am sure that there were a lot of consequences at home that he suffered under the hands of his father fortunately for ronnie it wasn't long before he would leave home away from the abusive household and go to university he first studied in hasselt before transferring to a college in Leuven. Now, according to Seven Source 7, he would finance his studies by doing odd jobs for people, kind of like a handyman. And Ronnie's efforts ultimately paid off when in 1993, he graduated with a distinction diploma in industrial engineering. Ronnie's life was finally beginning to turn around. In 1993, he also met a girl called Natalie and the pair quickly began dating. Two years later, the pair actually got married. Ronnie began teaching computer science in his spare time and in 1996, Natalie landed a job at Lysec, so the couple moved to Genk. Ronnie quickly landed a job as a technical and production manager at Fest Park in Genk, but soon turned back to teaching 
full time. Between 1998 and the year 2000, he taught a wide variety of courses, all surrounding computer science and mechanics in the nearby town of Marsec. At the turn of the millennium in the year 2000, the couple then moved to Hallen, where Ronnie began working a teaching job at Herk de Stad. He taught IT, economics, technology, and applied mathematics at the school, and in all accounts, all of his students loved him to pieces. He also quickly became involved in the community and was seemingly loved by all. He was someone who you could approach easily, you could have an easy conversation with, he was just viewed as a generally all-round good person. Now Ronnie had always been a big lover of mother nature and he routinely went out at night uh, on hikes and on walks and this helps his insomnia a lot so when he couldn't sleep he'd go on a hike and when he got back he'd feel relaxed enough to be able to go back to sleep. Everything seemed to be on track for Ronnie and his wife with even plans for them to expand their family and have children. However over over the course of the next five years, their marriage began to break down, arguments after arguments. According to his wife, their individual outlooks on life were just incompatible with one another. And according to Ronnie, it was his insomnia that was to blame. The final nail in the coffin was struck in December of 2005, when Natalie filed a complaint against Ronnie for rape. According to the complaint, Ronnie had given her a drug called Trizolin. Trizolin is actually a derivative of Trizodin, which is a common antidepressant medication. It is used to treat a variety of mental illnesses, including major depressive disorder anxiety disorders, and alcohol dependence. Importantly to note, the drug also has a sedative effect. Natalie's complaint against her husband Ronnie shows that Ronnie had allegedly administered this drug, given her the antidepressant, before raping her. Ronnie actually argues against this, saying that the drug was simply for her mental health and that it was a completely consensual sexual relationship. Now the case was actually closed without any further action taking place because the authorities simply did not believe Natalie's accounts. They doubted her completely. And with the closure of this case, the couple then separated and eventually divorced. According to Rain.org, only 230 out of every 1,000 sexual assaults are reported to the police. And of the sexual violent crimes not reported to police from 2005 to 2010, 13% believed that the police would not do anything to help, and 8% believed it was not important enough to report. These statistics are shocking, but also not surprising to me. I've spoken about similar statistics on this channel before, and in my opinion, it is shocking and heartbreaking to see that people don't have this trust in authorities, but at the same time, I can completely understand. Rain.org also shows that out of a thousand perpetrators of sexual assault and rape, 995 of them will walk free. It can sometimes feel like you're helpless. I'm a big supporter of charities and organizations such as the organization Rain, which can help those sexual assault survivors uh, in finding justice and other emotional support and can aid in your recovery. If you or anybody you know has been affected by any of the topics discussed in today's video, then you can find a link in my description box down below, which has a whole bunch of different charities worldwide and organizations that you can contact for help and you can contact for advice. Of course, if there is an emergency, please contact your local authorities. If the authorities had taken Natalie's complaint seriously against her husband, then the victims in this case would likely still be alive today. Due to the complaint against Ronnie, the investigators arrested him on the 4th of January 2010, two days after the murders, and took him to the local police station for questioning in connection to the murders of Shana and Kevin. That same evening, Ronald Jansen, who was a loved teacher and very reputable charity worker, confessed to the double homicide. This is Ronnie's version of events from his initial confession. That Saturday evening on the 2nd of January 2010, 
Ronnie had been out in his front lawn, watching the stars and watching nature, when all of a sudden, his neighbours Shana and Kevin came home in their Corsa. As they pulled up, Kevin noticed Ronnie stood on the grass watching the stars and moved his car in a way that made it look like he was about to hit him, before yelling out of the window, imbecile pig. Ronnie then claims that he ran into his house in a fit of rage. He told investigators that he knew at that point that he wanted to kill them, he wanted to kill Shana and Kevin. Ronnie picked up two weapons that he kept in his house, along with an empty bottle of white wine, which he then went and filled up using the petrol in his lawnmower. He then went over to his neighbour's home and knocked on the door. Shana answered the door to him holding a gun and at gunpoint, Ronnie forced Shana and Kevin into their car. He forced Shana into the back seat of the three-door Corsa, which meant that she was trapped as obviously there are no other passenger doors in the back seat. She has to go through the front passenger or the driver's side door. He then at gunpoint forced Kevin into the driver's side before getting in the passenger side. Following that, he instructed Kevin to drive and so they did. They kept driving until Ronnie commanded that they pull over in a lay-by. As soon as the car came to a stop, Ronnie fired his gun twice at Kevin, hitting him twice in the temple, killing him instantly. Shana remained in the back of the car, completely unable to escape the horrors that she had just witnessed. Ronnie then pushed Kevin out of the driver's side door, dragged him to the back of the vehicle, got back in to the driver's side, and reversed the car over Kevin's body. Shana, throughout this entire ordeal, didn't say a word, fearing for her life. When Ronnie was finished running over Kevin's lifeless body, body, his attention turned to Shana, who immediately began begging for her life. Ronnie told her that he would let her go, on the condition that she would have sex with her. And so, Shana agreed, and the two engaged in sexual intercourse. After the fact, Ronnie came to the realisation that Shana had only had sex with him because she was scared of him, which meant that it was rape and unconsensual. Ronnie then instructed Shana to turn over so her back was towards him before firing his gun twice at her head, once at her chest and once more to her lower body. Ronnie then grabbed Kevin's body off the side of the road, put it in the trunk before getting back into the driver's side and driving on for a bit. He drove the car to the location where the firefighters would later discover it on fire before using the petrol in the white wine bottle to douse the car and everything inside of it and setting it alight. Afterwards, Ronnie simply walked home through the fields. He told the police that he got home at about 4am and when he got home, he took off all the bloodied clothes and burnt them on a stove. He then collected the ashes and discarded them in a ditch as to get rid of any kind of forensic evidence. He then also threw his guns or gun into the river. I couldn't quite make out whether it was just one gun or two guns, but it's important to note that the weapon that was thrown into the river has never been located since. It's never been recovered. Now, interestingly, Ronnie would later go on to retract his confession of raping Shana, and I believe he did this in order to remove the uh, the prosecution on, and the accusation that the crime had been motivated by sex and by the rape, um, and he did this as a way to protect himself and to build a strong defense that he was just angry and raged but obviously he'd already confessed to it and obviously the damage had already been done, I guess, for his defense. Ronald Jansen then also made the surprise confession to the 2007 murder of Annick van Jutzel, attacking her at random before admitting to three more rapes that he had conducted in Leuven whilst he was studying there. However, it's important to note that no evidence has been found to support these uh, confession of these three rapes. Ronnie is actually suspected by the authorities for being responsible for as many as 20 different rape cases that had taken place between 2001 and 2010. And all of these cases were cases where the rapist had used a knife or a weapon to force the victim to engage in sexual acts. 
The trial against Ronald Jansen began on Tuesday the 20th of September 2011 with the selection of the jury, with the full trial then beginning three days later on the 23rd of September. After a four-week trial, all 12 members of the jury came to a decision on Ronnie's guilt. Ronnie was being charged with the illegal deprivation of liberty and murder of Anik van Jutzel, the murder of Kevin Paulus, and the torture, rape, and murder of Shauna Appletons. The jury found Ronald Jansen guilty on all counts. The jury told the court of how there had been sufficient evidence that Anik hadn't gone with Ronald willingly and she had been taken uh, at force, abducted. Anik had suffered multiple bruises consistent with being forced to do something the evidence that her phone had been switched on and off multiple times, and there had even been reports of screams being heard around the same time that Anik went missing. The jury also argued that no clothes were found on the remains of Shana, which implied to the jury the possibility, the strong possibility, of the uh, retracted confession of rape being true, despite Ronnie denying these allegations. The highest court in Belgium found that Ronnie treated his victims as objects instead of people. He didn't view them as humans that had emotions or a conscience, he viewed them as objects. The judge made it clear that no mitigating circumstances could be invoked, not for the circumstances of the facts, nor for the personality of the accused. That personality was described as being exclusively me-focused. Ronnie is a core psychopath with sexual abnormal behaviour. The chance of successful treatment and rehabilitation is minimal, and the risk of reoccurrence in this case is very large. Ronald Jansen was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. After hearing his sentencing, Ronnie left the courtroom with a gleaming smile on his face a fact that gives me goosebumps just to think about. Ronnie was actually brought to trial again for the second time in September of 2012 on multiple rape charges, which he was actually found guilty on all accounts. Uh, however, due to his already life sentencing, he no more years were added to his sentence. I've mentioned this before on my channel, but a life sentence in Belgium isn't a life sentence, isn't until you die, it isn't 100 years or anything like that. It actually means a sentence anywhere between 15 to 23 years before you can apply for parole. And after that minimum sentence is served, uh, an inmate can apply for parole. Of course, the parole court can reject an inmate's parole application, but the inmate can reapply every year after that. A lot of life sentences actually end up being about 18 to 20 years long due to this. This means that Ronald is up for parole in 2026. However, it is my hope that Ronald's parole, due to what the judge said about his uh, chances of rehabilitation being very unsuccessful, it's my hope that he remains in prison until the day he dies. A number of medical professionals and lawyers described Ronnie as fitting the profile of a serial killer. He is a charming, social, friendly, and admirable man. Someone that you would let your daughter go to a party with, much like Ted Bundy. Further to this, professionals stated that due to the cold-blooded manner in which he carried out his crimes, it is highly likely that he had murdered before. Due to this, numerous cases for unsolved murders were reopened in Belgium, including the case of Kim and Ken Heyerman, who are 11 and 8 respectively. According to some sources, Kim and Ken were both kidnapped on the 4th of January 1994 after they had gone out to play with some friends. It was initially assumed that both the children had run away from home, and at one point the children's mother was also suspected of being involved. A child's body was sadly then found at the bottom of a dock in Antwerp on the 11th of February that same year, which was later determined to be the remains of 11-year-old Kim. Subsequently, the case hit national headlines. An autopsy determines that Kim had actually been sexually assaulted before she had been killed, and sadly, Ken's body has never been recovered. Now, interestingly, Ronnie would later teach Kim and Ken's little brother, Axel. Ronnie had also lived in the same area as Kim and Ken, 
when they went missing. However, it was quickly determined that it seemed improbable that Ronnie had any connection to the crime. Although links were drawn between Kim and Ken's case and the Mark to True case, and if you don't know the Mark to True case, then I did a three-part series covering the case in almost its entirety, uh, which you can find, you can watch episode one by clicking the link in the iCards above. Sadly, Kim and Ken's case remains unsolved to this day. The case of Catrian D. Cooper was also reopened to determine whether Ronnie had any connection or involvement in that case. According to the case's Wikipedia page, on the evening of the 17th of December 1991, 15-year-old Catherine de Cooper went missing in the city of Antwerp. She'd gone to visit a friend at her house before leaving to walk to the bus stop to catch a bus alone. She had phoned her parents at 9.30pm to tell them that she was about to get the bus. Sadly, Catrian never boarded the bus. Six months later, her body was found just like Kim's body was found at the bottom of a dock in Antwerp. And just like with Kim and Ken's case, Ronnie had lived in the area when Catrian went missing, but no connection could be drawn between Ronnie and her case. Further to this, Catrian's case was also implicated in the Mark to True case. This leads me to question whether Ronnie worked alone truly, or whether he had some involvement in the Mark to True network, or whether he knew of the Mark to True network, or something like that where they had any connections to the network but sadly we just won't ever know that. It's something that we may never know. Now as I touched on earlier, Ronnie did confess to a number of major sexual assault uh, crimes. In total he was ultimately found guilty of five serious sexual offences and he is still in prison to this day. And that's everything that I have for you in today's case. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case series. If you want to check out the three-part Mark to True series, then you can do by clicking the link in the iCards above. Don't forget to follow me over on Instagram and Twitter. Subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. Also, jump over to my second channel and hit subscribe over there so you can watch some borderline true crime content and more relaxed content. You can find a link to that in the description box down below and in the iCards. If you want to get access to a video a day early, then hit that join button, the blue one down below, to become a channel member for as little as $1 a month. For those of you who have made it this far, I actually have a little secret for you. Um, I will be, I'm currently working on a two-part series with a really good friend of mine covering a really, really interesting case that isn't really talked about. and. It has my mind running in circles, so I can't wait to share that case with you. I'm also aiming to cover a lot more European cases over the coming months, so stay tuned for that. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next video. We're now the